This is Eating Crow with Pete Durand. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the latest episode of the Eating Crow podcast. I've got uh, the pleasure of having Marcus Ogden with us. And Marcus is a successful author, but that's not all he is. So, Marcus, there's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff in your background that we're going to drill into, particularly the fact that you are an entrepreneur now. And you've gone through the grind and you've kind of turned the corner and have a successful business. I want to talk, touch on that, but there's some reasons why you are where you are. So why don't I introduce you and have you kind of give us a little bit of the background and, and kind of how you ended up where you are today. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Uh, my name is Marcus Ogden. I'm from Washington, D.C. I play in the NFL for almost six years. I am currently now a national and international team host speaker, Becca Coast, best-selling author, corporate trainer. I also do workshops for big clients and some consulting. I really learned a lot about life and being an entrepreneur from playing football. I was around a lot of great business owners. Every NFL team has a business owner. Sure. So with the Jaguars, I had Wayne Weaver, who was the founder of Nine West, um, great individual. When I played for the Ravens, I had Steve Bishotti, who of course founded you know, Aramark and yep. very successful uh, individual. Uh, when I played for the Titans, they had Bud Adams, who was into the oil industry. And then playing for the Buffalo Bills, we had Ralph Wilson. They were big real estate uh, tycoons back in the 60s and 70s. And they all took their money from their businesses and then evolved and grew into becoming NFL owners of different franchises and different teams. So really and truly, I learned a lot about entrepreneurship, leadership, from being around some great coaches, but also just being around great owners uh, throughout my career and just getting a chance to see how they operated, did business, was really eye-opening for me to help me be where I am today as an entrepreneur. That's really interesting. I don't, I don't know that, uh, particularly in your book, or people understand the fact that you were observing all of that while you were playing, right? The business side of things was one of the things that fascinated you. So when you think about your time in the NFL, which is, by the way, a business in and of itself, right? I mean, it is a big, big business. You're one of the products in that business that allows them to drive revenue. What was it in any one of the examples? By the way, it's funny you mentioned Nine West. I, 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 uh, my wife has boxes of Nine West shoes in her closet at all times. But, you know, what were the, some of the takeaways or the lessons that they shared with you that a lot, and by the way, all very different businesses you described. Sure. What were the things that you thought to yourself, I can apply that when I get out of the NFL? What were the key lessons that, that stood out? The big key lesson I learned from all of them is that great businesses are run by great and happy human capital. Okay. Every business has people that run it. I don't care what it is, technology, passion, you know, staffing, it doesn't matter, Peter. And if you have a business, but you don't have a good solid staff, or you don't have a good solid way of doing business, and you don't have a good healthy culture, mm -hmm. and that comes from the behaviors that you have basically come to do, plus the time it's taking you to get there, multiplied by the employees of the organization is going to set your culture. So if you don't have a good basis foundation of treating your human capital five star, then no matter what company you have, what business you're, you are in, that business will not thrive and grow because every company needs people to run it to grow, period. That's really great. And when you think about human capital, especially for an entrepreneur or somebody listening to this program, and they're starting to make their first hires, right? And they're starting to make those tough decisions. How do you, I'm going to ask you two questions. And by the way, this is really important in building an NFL team, right? You got chemistry, you got team chemistry. You may have some superstar players, but if the chemistry isn't there, the team isn't going to perform. And there's stories about the NFL all over like that. But if I'm building a small business, how do I identify the right human capital to be around me? And then what are the lessons you learn from those leaders on how to treat those employees once they come on board? So number one is you need to figure out what your strengths are. Okay. And then hire people to help you fill the gap. So I have a client, very successful uh, individual. She's trying to build up her skincare business. She has a great a lot of experience. She is a typical CEO. Mm -hmm. Like I told her, she needs to hire an ops manager 
or COO, someone to help her to be able to navigate within all the internal communications of the business mm -hmm. and then the external client base as you're trying to grow, different buyers, different people in the stores. She needs a classic COO or ops manager to fill the gap. She has a chief marketing officer, has a designer, has a CFO, but she's stressing. And I told her, well, you're stressing because you are a CEO. You need a COO or ops manager. So, and then what I also learned from business is you need to vet that people or that hire, excuse me. Right. You need to vet who you're hiring. When I started Caden, I was great. I was a classic CEO. Sure. I needed a COO. I hired, well not hired, I partnered with the COO. He was the wrong partner. Sure. The absolute not person I need to be with. He talked a lot of game. He talked a lot of big information. He was 41 years older than me. So he was able to get over on me a lot of things I didn't know about the sure. business. And I took it at his word. And in reality, we should have never been in commercial construction because we didn't have a COO who fit that space correctly. Sure. And as a result of that, we grew quickly. We had success because I was a good CEO getting business, getting jobs. But again, and it's all my fault. I should never partner with someone who I didn't vet. But I was right. young. I wanted to get a business going. I was depressed from not from leaving the game of football. I need something to throw myself into. I need something to take up my days. I wanted to stop drinking and gambling. So we got into business. That was the mistake. So right. what I would tell the audience that's listening is, number one, identify your strengths. What you're weak at, that's the first hire or the first hires you need to make to fill what you don't do well. But for God's sake, learn from my mistake that your hires or sure. partnerships don't go into it, you know, with your eyes closed and just your, your your arms open. Let's do this. Like, don't do that because right. that's when bad things can start to happen. And once they come on board, what are the things you learned that and you, you stressed this earlier that that human capital, if you treat them five stars? They hang around. So when you were going through that struggle with your COO and you had other people in your company and they could see the struggles, what are the lessons you learned about how to treat people and how to groom employees so that they, they see a long-term future in your business? I learned the most important aspect of grooming people to have them not just be in your company, but retain and stay in your company is allowing inclusion and having a good open door policy. Okay. One of my best team members tried to tell me about our mistakes, our shortcomings, our issues. Instead of listening to him, taking his advice and trying to move forward and progress into helping him to see we were changing, I shunned him. On a Friday evening, I told a well, Friday afternoon, I told him he's making a mistake. Go home. Have a great weekend. We're all good here. He comes in on Monday, Peter. He hands me his two resignation papers. He's gone to a new company. Six months later to the day, like he predicted, we went bankrupt. Mm. Plain and simple. That's a harsh lesson. So, <clears throat> you know, you, your, your lesson there is, is really two parts. It's... Um, not recognizing the contribution of a key individual and then not recognizing how important it is to keep them around. Right. And I think a lot of companies go through that. When you get big, you tend to think no one person can hurt an organization, but the right person in the right role can either lift the company up or actually take it down. So um, when you think about the business you've started now, which is your public speaking and your coaching and your training business, you know, one person, when you add, you know, your staff doubles from you to two, right? Or for you and your wife to three, that one person can have a really big impact in the organization because uh, it's 33% of the workforce if it's just three of you, right? I mean, it's, it's much yep. more dramatic. Yep. Yep. And it has to be the right person that has a shared alignment with the vision of you, your partner, or your other people in the company that is coming on board. If you all don't have an alignment around a shared vision, it's not going to work at all got it and it's absolutely imperative that you all share that alignment otherwise you're risking friction constant badgering arguing and eventually 
someone's going to leave or someone's going to get frustrated and go. And you own the business, you're not going anywhere. The person you brought on, you're going to have to, again, go through the whole process. You're going to have to go through the whole thing again. The turnover ratio gets high. So you must really be keen and hire that right person that fits your organization, but you all have to have an alignment around a shared vision. Otherwise, it just won't work. When you think about the, the NFL teams you played on and the different types of owners, how much does the owner impact that shared vision and the culture in an NFL team? Where did that really, where was that driven from? Was it driven from the GM, the coaching staff? Who sets that vision? Oh, it's always the owner. Like okay. the Patriots owner, Robert Kraft, hired Bill Belichick to do his job. Okay. And Robert and Bill see eye to eye, and Robert is the CEO, is the big picture vision guy. Bill is the, is the strategy guy to win the annual goal of the Super Bowl. Okay. And then he hires his coaches, off of the coordinator, Josh Daniels, the coordinator coaches, to tactically execute the strategy he's laid out each year to win the Super Bowl. Okay. And Robert does not get involved. He doesn't – question anything he just backs up bill if there's any discussions or any uh, any type of uh, you know uh, having a good healthy dialogue it's behind closed doors they always have showed a unified front with the patriots as a result of that that's why i feel he's won six super bowls because that he does exactly what he's supposed to do robert Kraft gives him the reins to do so and he has an annual yearly goal and then the coaches execute the every day, every week, every month activities needed to achieve that goal. And then they'll set a new goal the next year. But Robert Kraft is the big guy looking for sponsorships, partnerships, and it's easy to get those things when you have six Super Bowl rings out of, I think, like seven or – like out of, like, ten years. Yeah. Yeah, I think they've, uh, they've won six rings. I think they've been to, you know, like, nine or ten – maybe 11 Super Bowls and that's it in that period of time as well. It's amazing. Um, you know, you, you identified something earlier about bringing on, you know, the, the person that addresses your weak spots or a COO, as you described for your friend that, that is the CEO. In a sense, you know, uh, obviously Bill Belichick is the COO of the, of the Patriots. What I find amazing, and I'd love to hear your thoughts here, is he has shuffled in and out offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators, line coaches. His whole coaching staff has changed multiple times his players have changed multiple times uh throughout that winning you know history tell describe what you see in bill belichick as a leader that allows him to bring in different people and get them aligned to the vision oh it's it's his it's his ability to set the agenda and the vision each year okay and whoever comes onto the staff or the players they buy into his vision otherwise you won't be there Sure. I mean, I'm Tom Brady, great player, go. But at this point in his, his career, he did not fit the vision of what Bill Belichick wanted to have done. Is Cam Newton better than Tom Brady? No. Is Cam Newton better than Tom Brady for Belichick's vision for this year? The answer is yes. Sure. And, again, that's what he does. He's masterful at getting people to come in and fit into his scheme his agenda, his vision to get where they're trying to go. Where a lot of coaches, they get attached to players, they don't have a lot of sentiment, they sometimes don't make the best decisions, you know, and Bill is very different, very analytical, and as a result of that, he puts out amazing products year after year on the gridiron. So let's step uh... – over to the side a minute and talk about your business. When, when we first met, you described you've been able to assemble, a, I mean, from the outside looking in, you know, your company has accomplished a lot, right? You've got uh, uh, your websites constantly evolving, your content, the uh, number of people that you're speaking in front of, the books you've written, you, and you, you've got multiple revenue streams. You said that was a really important thing for you is to drive multiple revenue streams. You've been able to do this with some very well thought strategic partnerships with different people who help you with every aspect of your business. Some of them are contractors, some of them are full time, some of them are people you've partnered with, and that continues to evolve. One person that might get you here is not the person that's going to get you to the next level. That's a lot to manage and navigate. How did you connect your 
NFL experience in watching Bill Belichick and other coaches assemble different coaching staffs, different player rosters, but still drive the same amount of success. You know, your, your business, you've got subcontractors, contractors, full-time employees, but there's a vision, right? There's a Marcus Ogden vision for the products and services you want to offer. How have you been able to navigate managing all these different resources? And I think when we talked, some of them have changed because your needs have changed. You almost describe the same situation. So for me, the important thing is, again, around a line of a shared vision, but I need to have people who have expertise in certain areas. And I'm much better today at vetting people, background checks, doing, you know, looking at referrals, testimonials, and then I get those people onto the team. And then the important thing I've learned is we have good communication. We have once a month staff calls, working with different people. I'm always communicating to my contractors, to my employees, uh, 1099, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. consistently and always communicating on what's working, what's not working, what I need help with, what is their, you know, what's going on with them, what's their needs at the time to go forward, you know, and we always do this. And we've gotten very systematic with the approach. And then one of my uh, employees became a partner in my business where I pay her a fee and then I give her bonuses off certain work because she is the main glue that kind of brought in other pieces, the website person. Uh, she helped bring in the person to help us with our videography work. She brought in the person to help us with our overall, you know, the strategy that's you know, part of the business. Uh, she's helping me to create the PowerPoint when we go uh, with our automation with the gentleman out of Las Vegas. So again, everything that we're doing is really focused on that level. And that's kind of where we're at. We're in the position of learning how to let people who are experts, Peter, do their job, communicate with us what are their needs, and then being consistent and following through to make sure that everything goes the best to, uh, of their ability and of my ability as well. You know, you said something interesting there, and, and I kind of like where it's headed, and I'm thinking about our team and the people that we work with. A very simple what's working, what's not working, right? And if you can have that quick discussion, here are the things that are not working, how do we address them? Here are the things that are going well, let's keep doing them. Um, is that a formal process, or do you kind of do that informally? A little bit of both. So we'll have a formal process with the meeting once a month to ask, hey, everybody will kind of shoot the stuff a little bit. Okay, you need updates. Then everybody goes around and tells their updates. Does anybody need anything? You go around, see if anybody needs anything. And then from there, what we do is it puts us in position so we know what's to be expected and what people need. And then you can learn how to grow from there. And sure. as we grow more and get this part of the business going with automation, we'll probably bring on maybe one other, maybe one more person to kind of help with streamlining everything all the time because my partner is good at it, but she's more on the creative side and I'll, I'll probably find someone kind of like an ops manager sure. to a degree to handle everything internally and externally so we can be very, you know, set very smooth in the business. I don't have to do a lot of the, um, the scheduling and things like that, which I'm doing now, which I don't mind, but right. if we get bigger, I think that's going to be our next, uh, our next piece. We have a good website person, a good biography person, a good trademark person, a branding person. We have a great, you know, people on the uh, automation side. We're going to just be looking for that maybe ops manager to be a, um, an, in, an internal piece with me and my partner at that regard. Got it. So you're thinking about scale at this point, which is great. Yep. When you, when you look back at um, the clients you're now talking to who have said, hey, Marcus, we need, we need to understand. And, and by the way, I think the success cycle, which is your book, by the way, that I've got in front of me. I'm going to hold it up here so everybody can see that, right? So the mm -hmm. success cycle has some really solid tips on getting started, finding your why, doing the grind, right? Staying with it. When you think about talking to a very large company mm -hmm. and they've asked you to speak to them, what's the biggest lesson they're looking for? Their look, it depends. It could be on leadership. It could be on how to grow sales. It could be on diversity and inclusion. It's a multitude of different topics, to be honest with you. But what I always want people to understand, one of my underlining principles is you have to be inspired over motivated to get where you want to be in life. Mm -hmm. That's the big thing I talk about with businesses because if you're at a business just for external gain, for money, and for notoriety, 
at some point you will burn out. Regardless of what you think, it's going to happen. Right. So you need to be inspired and you need to have, again, I say this word a lot, but this phrase a lot, you need to have a shared alignment with the vision and or mission of the company you are serving and working for. Okay. If it's not aligned to where you're trying to go or what you're trying to do, then eventually you will not work as hard, you'll get burnt out, you'll get stressed out, and you'll leave. And that creates a turnover ratio. Now, I know people have to pay the bills. I get all that. But at some point, you need to be honest with yourself and say, okay, do I want to keep doing this if I'm not aligned? Because if it's not aligned, it's going to affect your work production. It's mm -hmm. going to affect your workflow. And you're going, to, you're going to start to create and craft a culture that every company needs to thrive, a healthy, strong, open-door policy culture. Steve Jobs said it best. His hardest job at Apple was to make sure everyone allowed themselves to feel that they could say what they needed to say without fear of being judged all day long. So it's a lot of work, but again, you have to have that alignment and you have to be real with yourself that you actually truly do want to be where you are in the corporate sector for the, at that time. So help us understand when you think about how that alignment and vision comes into play for someone who's um, working on a factory floor and they're on the assembly line building drills, right, for Milwaukee Power Tools. How does the vision and alignment translate to somebody in that role? Oh, that, again, he is a foundational, he or she is a foundational piece of the puzzle. Okay. If they don't do their job, then the company cannot do its job. It cannot right. make profit. It cannot serve the community. Everyone has a job, has a meaning at a company. Some might be more large than others. Some might be seen by the external more than others. Some might just be all internal. But if you're on that tool belt line, making the products, making the tools, if you don't do your job, then sales and marketing and branding have nothing to do. They can't, sure. You don't make the products, you can't market anything, you can't sell anything, you can't brand anything. So you have to look at it from that perspective that everybody, no matter how you feel about your job, if you're at an organization, in some capacity, you mean something to that organization. Otherwise, they wouldn't be paying you their money. So let's, uh, let's drill down on that a bit. You know, I'm thinking about a place kicker in a football team, right? They come out, very, very specific task. They're not, they don't play football the way the other guys play football, right? But they're just as important. You can see how many games have gone either way based on a place kick, right? Or an extra point or a field goal. And I'm thinking about this person working on the, on the factory floor on, you know, the drill or tool belt assembly line, the complexities of getting the shared vision from the owner or the, you know, the investors all the way down through the organization to that person who's working in that factory floor to make sure they're shared into that vision. I've seen it done, right? Um, snap on tools is from my home state of Wisconsin. The people there really believe their job is to make the best tools in the world. Right. So if they're working on that factory floor, they may have their dad may have worked there. Their brother may work there. But when they walk in every day, there's a couple of things that always struck me. And, I, and I'm, I'm an engineer, so I grew up working on factory floors. What's the appearance of the factory floor? Is it clean? Is it well organized? Is it polished? Is there pride of ownership? To me, that's a big thing. Right. Is there pride of ownership? So when I walk in there, I feel like I'm in a place that cares about me, cares about our product, wants to be the best. Because that's what's interesting. That's what I'm trying to drill into is when you're on a football team, you know what the goal is, right, to win a Super Bowl. Uh, when you're working for a, a high-end consulting firm, you know what the goal is, right? But when an organization gets really large, there's multi-levels, it's much more difficult to translate that vision. So you've got to be thoughtful. And I, and I think what you're saying is you have to, first of all, let everyone know they're important and their role is valuable. That's the number one thing. But then you have to demonstrate that you actually care about them. Mm -hmm. Right. And you care about their input. Right. So I would love to know in some of the companies I worked at, it'd be great for that person to be able to raise their hand and say, there's a better way for us to make this drill. Would you hear me out? And if they're heard and you do it, that, that tends to, to propagate that vision on down that we want to make the best doggone power tools in the industry. I don't know what their vision is, but it's probably something along those lines. And 
they probably have some sort of community involvement. So, you know, I can imagine you're speaking to very, very different companies. So you've got to think of a way of translating that message so that they can resonate with that with their own people. Mm -hmm. Yep. And again, every company like that, you have to be able to get the attention of the mid-level managers. I call mm -hmm. them the conduits of the business. Okay. The bridge between the employees and the C-level executives. If your top level managers are not working well with the mid-level managers who are literally the ones with the employees down there in the trenches with them, mm -hmm. then it's not going to work. So this is why when I spoke for Liberty Mutual Insurance in Boston, they had a lot of their sales team. They had a lot of their leaders that were leading sales teams. They had the diversity and inclusion part there, and they were watching from all across the globe all different parts, all different leaderships, all different people. But there, it was interesting. Their president of global sales was actually in the room when I spoke. And he's number two in charge of the entire organization behind their CEO. And he said, Marcus, thank you so much for telling your story and applying it to the language we speak. But mm -hmm. also using part of your story that applies to our business on the sales aspect, on the aspect of you know, how you made mistakes, how you could bounce back. And then you talk to us about some applicable action steps that we can start doing, such as resiliency plans. We talked about how you could be better at, you know, uh, at the word sales. We talked about how you can pivot when necessary when things happen in the, in the society, like they're happening, uh, you know, they were starting to happen a little bit at that time back in February, mm -hmm. but they have totally shifted. But you have to really be able to speak their language, make the leaders understand, again, the mid-level managers, upper managers, and the C-level executives, that the communication from it starts uphill comes downhill. Mm -hmm. And if you have good managers and good bridge, I call them conduit or bridge individuals, that can keep the communication between the employees and the C-level executives consistent and congruent, then you're in A, you're in a plus shape. But the ones who aren't doing that are the ones who are breaking down at that level where the communication from the up to the people down on the floor working is being, you know, it's just being distorted. And by the time it gets to them, they don't know what to believe. And then it's causing all types of problems, issues, and uh, some potential, you know, repercussions on, on the floor. Sure. So I didn't realize uh, in hearing more about your thought process, the, the way you're combining your experience in the NFL with your combination of the experience in your construction business, right? So in the right. NFL, you got a lot of lessons, both good and bad, about how really strong teams built a vision and a culture and executed all the way down through the, the GM, the head coach, the assistant coaches, the line coaches, et cetera, that conduit you described. But then in your construction business, that you said that kind of, kind of got broken, right? It didn't, it didn't make it up or something happened. And then when that key person left, um, that really started to impact your business. That's right. It did. When, I, when my senior estimator left the company, he was the only person that wasn't a yes person. And when I lost that, I lost sight of how good and or bad it really was in the field and in the office. Right. Because my estimator was the conduit for me on the inside, the interior, to the outside with our superintendents and our, and our foremen. So when he left, the, not only did the bidding go really, really not correct, mm -hmm. but the communication from the office to the field leaders broke down. Right. And then that's when the company just started to implode day by day, week by week. And then six months later, I'm out Gone. of business. Gone. And that's what led to you kind of coming full circle and realizing after that low point in your life and a couple other lower points after that, that you thought, geez, I've got, I've got a lot to offer people and I can mm -hmm. do it by speaking in front of audiences and getting them to understand specific messages. So I'll, I'll be honest, when I read the book, I started to gravitate towards the drive and, and, and the vision you had for your personal business, right? For you creating uh, the Marcus Ogden Enterprises, I'll call it, right? But I had no idea the depth of observation and lessons learned in your previous company that you're bringing to organizations. There's a lot more here, right, that people don't quite understand. And whether it's management technique, leadership technique, organizational structure, uh, I think that's a great takeaway for our listeners is, you know, maybe sure they should, they should be looking around them, no matter where they work today, if they're in a big company and thinking about going out and starting their own company. 
there are a lot of lessons to be learned inside those organizations they're in, and they should be taking really copious notes, like which obviously you did, and how to apply both the bad and the good lessons going forward. Absolutely, because when you combine your life experience with your job experience and what you've gone through, the ups, the downs, the wins, the losses, it allows you to be a lot smarter mm-hmm. and a lot more well poised to be able to handle any type of involvement, any type of growth that you need to do, which we all need to do to achieve success and not get complacent or not get relaxed or mesmerized by early success. Yeah, it sounds like that eating crow moment for you is when that estimator left, right? And you realize oh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, like, that was it. As soon as he left, that was it. Six months later, I'm bankrupt and I'm out. And that was the beginning of the end for me. So eating crow for me was not listening to my trusted estimator, my trusted C-level executive, which he was mm-hmm. in my business, which was construction. And once he left, the hires after him were putrid, they were way below standard and the work on the inside and the outside reflected that you know, endlessly to the largest degree possible. And six months later, I'm out. Well, there's a, uh, there's a lot there and, and I appreciate you sharing that, that moment and, and opening up for us. But uh, I, uh, I hope that our listeners can potentially reach out to you if they have companies that could use your advice or your input it's amazing to think that one organizational shift had that much of an impact, not only in your company, but your life. Yep. And Linda, where it, you are today. It, it was the biggest mistake I ever made was not allowing my, my trusted leader, my trusted high level executive to give me his honest feedback. And when I didn't listen to him, that was the beginning of the end. As soon as he left, the company was, was, was doomed. Well, thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. And, uh, I want to hear more. I know your business is kind of just starting to take off. So at some point, we'll get you back in the podcast and see where things are and, and uh, learn more. But thanks again, Marcus. Really appreciate it. Absolutely, Pete. Thanks for having me, my friend. You bet. Talk to you soon. Thanks for checking out Eating Crow here on YouTube. Drop a like and subscribe so you never miss a video.